everyone, it's Brittany bringing you a word from our second week of the Advent devotional. If you haven't had a chance to, uh, to follow along, I've linked that in the description. There's no need to go back and catch up. You can just start where you are and do what you can. We're cultivating grace here in our busy schedules, so just pick up wherever you are. I am fired up about today's topic, though. We're talking about our mighty God, part of the Isaiah 9-6 prophecy that reads, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And today, I'm not going to do a big sweeping lesson, but rather I keep coming back to this scripture that's so meaningful to my life in Exodus 14. Because every time it reminds me of how mighty our God is, and it's a great picture of who we are in relation to that might. So let's turn to Exodus 14. I'm going to read from the ESV translation. Uh, the NIV should be pretty close, or maybe you want to follow along in the NLT or another one, and that's all fine too. I personally love looking at multiple translations because in the richness of the Hebrew language that the Bible, or at least the Old Testament, was written in, different translations can provide us with a greater understanding of what the original text meant to convey. So I don't become too much of a stickler about matching translations. But no matter which one you are using, as we read, I want you to think about all the places God shows his might and power in this passage. It starts, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Ha Hiroth. I practiced that and I still messed it up. Pi Ha Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zathan. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done, that we've let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pi Hai Haroth. <laughs> Pi Ha Haroth in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been far better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptian army whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have to only be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get the glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the hosts of Egypt and the host of Israel. 
and there was the cloud and and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all the Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee, flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the sea shore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. That was a lot. Wow. I love this story. It ties in with God being our wonderful counselor because he gives such specific instructions along the way. Where to camp, what direction their camp should face, how to walk through the waters, what's going to happen next. And we see God's power activated in the obedience of the people. As the Egyptian get, Egyptians begin to close in and the Israelites panic, Moses tells them these famous words to stop panicking, to silence their anxiety because God was going to fight for them. And what does God tell them? To get moving. Because it's through their obedience to keep putting one foot in front of the other that God was going to accomplish far more than they knew that day. This was the day he delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians forever, not just protecting them for the immediate moment, but putting down the threat of Egypt permanently, never to be pursued or enslaved by them again. This too was the day that Egypt itself would know the power of God. And we see that army proclaiming their own panic that God was fighting for the Israelites. This was the day that he would part the Red Sea and that he would demonstrate his authority and power over nature itself, including the waters and including even the heart of Pharaoh. And friends, this is the same power that came in Mary's womb as she bore the Christ child. It's the same power that laid in a humble manger that grew into a man and led a ministry of healing, redemption, and the forgiveness of sins. And it's the same power that God now gives us in the Holy Spirit who indwells us when we trust him for our salvation. But we do have to take steps. We don't have to part the sea, but we do have to get to the beach. We don't have to hold back the waters, but we do have to march forward through them. We don't have to defeat the armies, but we may be told to stretch out our hands. Remember the little boy whose lunch Jesus used to feed the multitude? When God is on our side, we see his might most incredibly in our obedience. But when we are in rebellion, we see his might more, most powerfully in our discipline as he leads us back into his loving arms. Friends, I want to leave you with a thought to ponder today. Three, maybe four times in this passage, it repeats that the Israelites walked through on dry ground. Now, I grew up next to Lake Michigan, and when water recedes, the ground is still damp and hard. It's walkable, for sure, but it doesn't really dry. So when God does something, he doesn't do it the way we do or the way nature does it. He does it like done. And Mark 4, 38 through 40 tells us the story of a great storm that terrified the disciples when they were out to sea. 
Jesus was sleeping in the bow of the boat and they woke him up in a panic. He immediately calmed the storm. Silent, be still, he said. But then he rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. Perhaps he was telling them as much as the storm to be silent and still, as Moses had told the Israelites. But the storm did not gradually die down as we see the storms normally do. Instead, it immediately obeyed. Actually, it was so immediate that the disciples were overwhelmed with fear at his power. They were beginning to see that Jesus wasn't just a healer, which was already miraculous. He wasn't just the authority over demons, which was already incredible. He was actually all powerful, bringing absolutely every aspect of existence under his authority at any given moment. And that's the power. If that's the power he possesses, then how dry was that ground they were walking on? How calm were those waves of the sea? And how much power does he have in the things that we're praying for, hoping for, and expecting him to show up for? If you're like me at all, you might think that what you're asking for is too big or too impossible to even bother. Or maybe you want to water it down so he'll even consider some smaller version of what you want. Or maybe you might feel, again like me, that you're interrupting him when you pray because he's got bigger fish to fry and greater things to worry about. But he is so mighty that nothing gets past him. We could pray for everything we wanted, as big as we can imagine, as long as we want, and he could hear, hold, and answer every one of us with the deepest love and care as easily as you or I could blink. Nothing is too hard for him, and nothing gets past him. So bring him your greatest fears, your biggest prayers, your loudest cries. He'll make edits as he sees fit, but we don't need to filter anything for him. All we need to do is obey. And when he says it's go time, then watch his power reign. What a mighty God we have. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are who you are and that you are on our side. We thank you for salvation in Christ that has bridged this chasm, eliminated that chasm altogether, and that we have your power and might both dwelling inside of us and all around us, that your angel armies are on our side, and that you hear every one of our cries, no matter how big, no matter how small, and no matter how ridiculous. We thank you, God, that we can bring anything to you, that you'll do the editing, and that we can trust you with everything because you truly are mighty God, mighty over all forces of nature, all powers, all dominions, everything that seeks to threaten us. God, we pray that this word would bless anybody listening to it. And God, I just pray that you would continue to show us your might and your power in the current age. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, I will see you next week when we're talking about our everlasting father.